if you have looked at the newspaper, uh, at the re newspaper recently, you're fully aware of the problem I want to discuss with you today. I've put a few headlines in this slide behind me, but the main message is all the same. Drugs, and especially drugs for rare diseases, are becoming increasingly expensive, and in many cases, even literally unaffordable. And pharmaceutical companies are blamed, healthcare insurance companies are blamed, and politicians, as they tend to do, they blame each other. Um, but there's one thing really clear, and that's that the development costs for these drugs, for new drugs, have increased dramatically in the last decades. And the reason behind this is actually something you're also fully aware of, and even if you haven't read a newspaper in the last 10 years. Because what are drugs usually tested on? Animals, yes, exactly, thank you. So it's, um, we have really simple models, we call them in vitro models, then we test on animals. And when these preclinical models, as we call them, are done and they have proven to be safe, we go and test drugs on, um, on humans in the clinical trials. Now, in these preclinical trials, um, pharmaceutical companies have invested millions of dollars, sometimes even billions of dollars, and years and years of, uh, of research. But despite all those investments, we still see that as soon as we test them in humans, nine out of 10 drugs fail directly. And of course, that one drug that does make it to the market has to compensate for the cost that has been generated by all the drugs that are lost along the way. Now, why are these preclinical models so inaccurate? Why can they not predict what's happening in a human body? Well, here's why, and this is going to shock you, but animals are not the same as humans. <laughs> now, this is a conclusion that my four-year-old niece would be able to draw. That's true, but it's really important. If we look cl more closely at the different species, for example, at the heart, and the heart is, of course, really important if we want to determine whether a drug is safe to give to a patient. If we look at the heart of a mouse and a human, the first thing we measure is the beat rate. Now, of a mouse, it goes about 500 beats per minute, and a human normally around 60 or 80. I think mine is a little bit higher now, but okay. And um, that, that's not the biggest problem, actually. The biggest problem is the biology that is underlying this difference in beat rate. And that's the electrical activity of the heart. And you all know this electrical activity from the hospital, right? It's the ECG. It goes beep, 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 if everything's fine. And if everything goes south, it goes beep, and then well, everybody comes. Okay, well, you know this. But this electrical activity is the trigger of your heart. Now, you see that the trigger in the mouse and in the human is completely different. The shape and the timing is different. And this is because the proteins and the molecules that work together to generate this electrical activity they are completely different in the mouse and in the human. So if we have a drug, and many drugs actually interact with these proteins and these molecules, if we have a drug that we give to the mouse and we don't see any effect, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's no effect on the electrical activity of the human. Mm -hmm. So this makes it really tricky to determine whether something is safe to give to a patient based on the results of a mouse. So you might think, okay, well, then we're gonna test everything on humans. Well, Apart from all the ethical issues, I'll give you another life lesson. Humans are not the same as humans either. Well, at least in some cases. For example, think about a patient that has cancer, uh, or two patients that have cancer. They have the same type of cancer, and they, give, they are given the same chemotherapy. And we know that some patients get well, while others do not, they don't see an effect at all. Now, and this difference is in part because the body responds differently to the same disease or every body, uh, every individual body responds differently to the same disease or the same drug. Now, that's why we want to test something, not on just any person, on any human being, but we want to test something specifically on you. And in some cases, this is already being done. For example, if you think you have an allergy, you go to the doctor, and he exposes your skin to different kind of potential allergens. Now, whatever, whichever one shows up red is the, is the one that's causing the allergy. But, for example, for the heart, as you already noticed, it's my favorite organ, um, this is impossible. We cannot just expose a part of our heart to some kind of drug or some kind of therapy. We can also not just remove a part out of it and put it in a dish and test our drugs there, because if we remove something of our heart, it doesn't grow back easily. Now, and that's why in the lab where I work, we are trying to recreate a piece of your heart in a dish from scratch. 
Well, not entirely from scratch. We try to do this from stem cells. And you all know stem cells. They're in our body, and you might know them um, from stem cell therapy, and then usually they're removed from your bone marrow. But you also have them in your skin, and you also have them in your gut. And we call them adult stem cells. And we call them adult not because they're in your adult body, but because they're already directed to become a certain type of tissue. So stem cells in the skin will only become skin cells. Stem cells in the gut will only become gut cells. However, when you were young, and now young is a kind of an understatement because it was when you were an embryo, you actually consisted um, of a ball, let's say, of um, different kind of stem cells. They're called pluripotent stem cells. They can become everything of the human body. In fact, they have, you have become everything out of these stem cells. Unfortunately, we lose these cells during the development. Now, in 2006, there was a smart scientist, Yosh, uh, Shinya Yamanaka, I have to say it correctly, um, and he won the Nobel Prize for this, um, for this discovery where he realized we could remove cells from our adult body, then put them in a dish in the lab, in a Petri dish, and then genetically reprogram them to become pluripotent stem cells again. And these cells can now again become everything in the human body. And we use those cells, these kind of cells in our lab, to make heart cells. And we do this by following sort of a nature-inspired cooking recipe. So basically, we have these cells in a dish, and we add hormones and growth factors just as these cells would experience when they're in the uh, human body during the development of the heart. And after two weeks of adding these hormones growth factors and removing them again, we look under the microscope and we see this. Beating, and they're really slowly beating here, but they're normally they have sort of similar pace as the human because they're beating human heart cells in a dish of whoever we made them of. And you have to imagine what this means, what we can do with this. For example, if we have two patients and one of them has a mutation in its DNA that prolongs the electrical activity, the ECG, what we already talked about in the hospital, this prolongation is potentially dangerous is if we give a drug that um, prolongs the electrical activity even more. So what we can do now is take a piece of skin or urine or blood from these patients, extract the cells, reprogram those cells into pluripotent stem cells, and then differentiate them towards our heart cells. And what we then uh, get and uh, what we can measure, and colleagues of mine in my lab have done this, we find the same electrical prolongation in electrical activity in those cells as we see in the patients. And now we can use this to test drugs and to see if we can either rescue the phenotype or see which drugs are tolerated by the patients. Now, this might be the right time to introduce a big disclaimer. Because uh, about all of this biology, don't trust me, I'm an engineer. Actually, I studied electrical engineering at the Technical University of Delft, and um, I was uh, trained to build computer chips, like the ones in your smartphone. Now, um, you might ask, how do you go from building computer chips towards growing cardio, cardiac cells? Uh, that's a good question. And you might also uh, ask why. Well, the why is actually simple. And I'm going to show you this movie again. Because I think this is absolutely incredible. These cells are more ingenious than anything we've ever, ever engineered. But then the how. How does it work? What does an uh, engineer do in a developmental biology lab? Well, to be honest, when I started in that lab, I didn't really have a clear idea as well. But it turns out that if we combine the biological knowledge with the technological knowledge, that we can actually make really complex tools, like the one showed here. And I cannot go into all the technical details of this system, but what we can do with it is measure the three most fundamental parameters of the heart simultaneously. And this is the electrical activity that you all know by now and the contraction, which is, of course, the end goal of the cells. And finally, the calcium. And the calcium is necessary for the cells to contract. Now, these um, kind of systems 
we, um, we can make with this combination of technology and biology. And what we do is we have the cells in a sort of a Petri dish. Well, actually, it's a sort of a, uh, a plate with a lot of Petri dishes. We grow our cells there. And then we add an optical chemical dye inside. And this optical chemical dye is triggered by the LEDs on the other side. And then with the high-speed camera that's attached to the microscope, we can make a really nice recording with a high temporal resolution so we can get a really accurate measurement of what is going on there. And I'll show you a movie how that looks like in a bit. But first, I'll show you what the setup looks like. So it's kind of dark. You see a lot of wires. But if you don't believe it really takes an engineer to build this, I made a kind of an enlargement of a certain area. And you clearly see duct tape and <laughs> tie rest. I can tell you it's state of the art engineering. <laughs> but what's really cool is if we is when we look through the microscope. And what I'm going to show you is a movie of the cells that are um, uh, labeled, that are loaded with this calcium sensor. And every time the cells beat, you see that the calcium sensor increases in activity. So these are, again, human heart cells in a dish. And on the right side, you see a graph. And this tracks the intensity of the cells. This tracks how many calcium is in the cells. And with this, kind of tools, we can actually test what a drug does. So there are many drugs that have a negative effect on the calcium in the cell. If we would add this, this to this well, to this uh, piece of cells, we will see that the activity drops. And this is exactly the tool that we can use to test new drugs. However, we still need to check whether it works with the old drugs. That's our validation set. And this is exactly what we've done. We've worked together with a pharmaceutical company, and they gave us 10 drugs. We didn't know which one was which, and we had to test them one by one using this system. Now, uh, after a while, we came back, and seven out of 10 we had correct. It was exactly what they, um, we predicted exactly what they found in humans. Two out of 10 were completely wrong. And one, well, I think we were right, they think we're wrong, but we'll settle in the middle, so 75% correct, I think. This is already really good. But we want to get to this 100%. We use human cells. Why isn't it 100% yet? There are two reasons. Mainly, one is because we're only looking at the heart. And that's not a complex interplay of the organs as we find in the human body. And the second one is that the cells are still a bit immature, like you would find in a, a newborn baby, for example. And we can see this if we look at the electrical activity again. So the cells are in the middle that we make. And you can see this electrical activity resembles the adult uh, electrical activity way more, but it's not as good yet, uh, yet as the adult uh, compared to the mouse, but it's not as good um, as the adult just yet. The timing and the shape is still a little bit off. And one of the reasons why it's maybe a little bit off is because the cells don't feel at home. They're in this Petri dish. It's really rigid. Uh, they don't like it. In the heart, they are in this soft environment exactly uh, nicely aligned in one direction, and they work together. So what we try to do, and again, engineering seems to be, uh, to, uh, seems to be the way to offer a solution. We made a really flexible, soft substrate and made really tiny grooves of 20 micrometers inside. And then we grew the cells on top of them, and this is what we see. The cells are now aligned in one direction, and they work together to pull this piece of rubber up and down. Now, we were, did this together with engineers from uh, the Technical University in Delft, and they took it a step further, and they built this hard-on-chip design uh, device. And you can see a, a cross-section of the design. Uh, in blue, you see the cells, and here you see again um, in brown the, um, the grooves in the uh, flexible substrate, in the soft substrate. Now, there are also electrodes built into this uh, substrate, so you can actually measure the electrical activity of the cells while they are contracting. And to make it even feel m more at home for the cells, we also make this uh, air chamber which we can inflate, and then the cells are stretched and strained, just like they would experience when they're in the heart. Now, this is what the, system, the device looks like in real life. And you can see it's really small. And making it really small is important because we have, uh, we uh, only need to use a really small amount of cells, which is, of course, makes it, uh, makes it a lot cheaper. Now, by making it cheaper and more accurate, this is the way it's going to change the development costs for drugs completely. 
Now we make this hard on chip device, but other people are making lung on chip and skin on chip. And actually, this whole field is called organ on chip. And in the Netherlands, uh, there's just an initiative that started where a lot of scientists all over the Netherlands work together to build mainly three different organs, which are the brain, the gut, and, um, uh, and the heart. And the idea is to, to make these exactly as the heart on chip with cells from patients and um, integrate the measurement methods, et cetera, et cetera. But not only make those three devices separately, but then couple them together using a blood flow in between. And when we can change the microbiome, for example, in the gut and see how that affects the brain. So we try to make a complete avatar of a human on a chip. We try to make a complete avatar of you on a chip if we use your cells. Now, when I talk about this, you understand that we need a lot of multidisciplinary um, uh, research to, to get this uh, going, uh, this get, to get this research further. And what uh, people usually show when they talk about such multidisciplinary research is a schematic like this. So we have this stem cell biology field, and we have this chip technology field. And where they meet, roughly in the middle, there's this organ on chip field, for example. But I think that's wrong. I think that's a wrong way to show it. I think it's different. I think if we uh, look, think about this, it should be that the, bio, uh, the stem cell biology field and the chip technology field are separated. And if people go out of their own fields and meet each other halfway, we find an even bigger field than the previous field, which is called, in this case, organ on chip. And this happens every time. So for example, we are, um, during my uh, research on organ on chip, we developed this software to quantify the contraction of the heart muscle cells in a dish. And we showed it to medical doctors. And they were, they were so enthusiastic that we're actually trying it out in patients now. So basically, we're combining this organ on chip field with the clinical field. And again, there's a huge increase in horizon. And this can happen again and again and again. Think about it. If we would uh, co combine this technolo these technologies with complex data analysis, or maybe if we have a brain on chip, maybe we can couple it to human psychology. And every time, our horizon will get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's why I believe if we step out of our own fields and cross our borders towards each other, that the possibilities are infinite. Thank you.